Vambrot from uh, Institute of Science and Technology in Vienna, uh, my good colleague, uh, who became famous uh, probably for his uh, seminal uh, book of uh, how to train probabilistic graphical models. But, well, excellent book with uh, uh, Sebastian. Uh, but he's also uh, known for his uh, different uh, research papers and on computer vision, on pack bias, uh, on uh, uh, different approximate methods for probabilistic inference. Uh, so today he, he will tell us about uh, one of uh, uh, new directions where uh, he became interested in, uh, in particular, classified adaptation at prediction time. So uh, let us uh, welcome Christoph. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, <coughs> yes, I will tell you today about classifier adaptation at prediction time. In, uh, in order to boost... I squi it switched it on. No, it's not. It's mute. No, it was mute. Come again? Hello, hello. Not working? One, two, three, test. Yeah. Test. Okay, good. So I'm going to tell you um, something about our recent work on classifier adaptation at prediction time. And in order to boost our ratings of the web stream, I will try to be as controversial as possible. So don't take everything I say completely seriously. Um, okay, I come to you from IST Austria. For those of you who have not heard about IST Austria before, we are a public research institute close to Vienna that concentrates on um, basic curiosity-driven research, interdisciplinarity uh, in the natural and formal sciences, so computer science, mathematics, uh, biology, neuroscience, physics, and so on. Um, and we are young and growing, so we have open positions, so in case any one of you wants to um, send me an email, feel free to do so. That was the commercial break, sorry. Now let's come back to science. Um, the group that I lead at IST Austria has a topic of machine learning and computer vision, and ultimately we try to solve a goal that is, is similar to what many groups in the field are. Um, we want to build automatic systems that can analyze and interpret data on a similar level as a human could. So if you have a natural image, like this one on the left, the computer should be able to form some internal representation that reflects that it understood that there are three people sitting there. there is, it's an indoor scene in a pub. One of them is talking, the others are listening, and so on. So to a person, this is a completely natural process. To a computer, this is currently not really achievable at the moment. <coughs> so this problem is too hard. We do what we usually do in science. If a problem is too hard, we break it down into smaller manageable subparts. Um, and we might want to solve problems like scene classification, we are given an image, the computer should only decide, is this an indoor scene or an outdoor scene? Um, what kind of scenery is it? Um, we might want to solve action classification. What are the people in this image doing or in this video? Um, and the most important, um, in order to understand what's going on in an image, might be object recognition. So what kind of objects do we see at all? In this case, we see three people at a table with glasses in front of them and so on. <coughs> So for the purpose of this talk, I will concentrate on object recognition, which we typically um, formulate as a, a classification problem. So given an image, the computer should output um, which object is visible by selecting one or more from a large list of possible objects. Um, and one possibility is to just assign a probability to each of them. So in this example, the computer should assign probabilities of how certain it is that a certain object is present in the image. <coughs> And, well, it's very certain that the person is not there, but that the cake is there. So in this case, it did a good job in classifying the uh, image as a cake. <coughs> so um, object recognition has a long history in computer vision, and it has gone pretty large. So when we think about the, the history, typically what happens is we have more and more data available. We have larger and larger data sets to play with. Um, and at the same time, also the number of categories that uh, people were interested in has grown. So when it started with uh, problems with had like a few hundred images at most and maybe five categories to distinguish, now the state of the art classifier data sets are like ImageNet or 80 million images where you have millions of images and thousands of categories. So it has really become a large scale endeavor to do object categorization. <coughs> At the same time, the methods have become more complex. So 
Um, here you see a visualization of the currently best performing methods for object recognition. These are convolutional neural networks. On the left is the one from 2011, um, AlexNetch, which has seven layers of linear and nonlinear arbitraries alternating. The one on the right is a schematic picture of the ResNet, which has 101 layers, and there's also one that has more than 1,000 layers. So these m models have become large, and they have a lot of free parameters, and they are very complex. <coughs> And finally, it has become computationally expensive to train these models. So nowadays, if you want to win a challenge like the ImageNet, you cannot do it by hand. Well, you cannot do it on your laptop. You cannot even work it on a workstation anymore. You need a GPU cluster. Um, and I don't know how many of you have a GPU cluster at home. Um, I don't. So chances are small that I will ever win the ImageNet challenge, um, which in some sense is a pity. In the other sense, I would say it's just a part of the normal process. So object recognition using deep networks and GPU training works so well these days that you can think of it almost as a, as a technique um, that is available and that companies can take over. So you don't build your own car anymore. If you want a car, you buy it from the manufacturer. So why would we train our own um, classifiers and not buy them from the manufacturers? So my hypothesis is <coughs> don't train any more object recognition systems. Industry, Google, Yandex, Facebook will be better at it anyway. They have the resources, they have the data. What, as far as I heard, at Facebook, people upload 2 billion images per day. I don't have 2 billion images in my lifetime, so don't. <coughs> Instead, I'm pretty much convinced that very soon we will be able to buy classifiers pre-trained at Amazon as somewhere else. And then the main question is now that as I, as a computer vision researcher, cannot train my own classifiers anymore, what should I do with my life? Um, so the next research challenge I think that we should address is how can we improve image understanding with pre-trained classifiers that we just get? And most of you working on computer vision do that already. You download a pre-trained image net model, for example, which is available for free. Um, not everybody trains from scratch anymore. So the question is, these are very powerful methods. What can we do with them? And how can we still do research on these levels in order to improve them? <coughs> OK, so let me show you what kind of challenges I mean by that. So um, a typical situation as an academic researcher as I am is that you work with uh, image data sets, and then you try to learn classifiers. And typically, the situation when you do prediction is the same as when you train the classifier. So visualized here, on the left, you see a little bit of the ImageNet data set. So this is where I train my classifier on, if I would still train it. <coughs> and then in order to see if it worked or not, I would uh, evaluate it on pictures on the right, which is also the ImageNet data set, just a different subset of it. So that's the very typical academic setting of how you um, train classifiers and use them afterwards. And in fact, you don't really use them. You just check how good they are. Right? It's not that I really need a object classification system in my life. I just need to develop methods that I, mean, I can then evaluate. So the most important part is uh, it's data according to the famous IID condition. It's uh, the training time and the prediction time. You have data distributed ex exactly identically, and all the samples are independent of each other. <coughs> Who else would need an object recognition system? Well, you can easily imagine that um, real people who are not academic researchers might want an object recognition system. For example, if you're a shop owner and you want to offer your customers some automatic cash register, then the cash register has to find out what did the person buy. So you might be in a setting like this, where you have um, the situation of the vendor who sells the um, classifiers, has trained them, and the customer takes them and wants to use them for their own purpose. <coughs> so here, in order to recognize different kinds of fruit, um, and the first thing we observe is that now we are not having the same distribution of data at training time and at test time anymore. So at training time, it will still be a completely generic system with all kind of object categories. But at prediction time, um, maybe only fruit are interesting to us. So I will refer to this as a domain shift. So we are not having the same data distribution at prediction time anymore as at the time when the classifiers were trained. The second thing that can happen is think of a surveillance uh, scenario, like at an airport. Um, we might want to classify um, suitcases or people doing their actions and so on. So not just that this is a different 
scenario, so a domain shift has happened. But also the samples, the images we have to classify, will now be um, not independent of each other. The picture I take now and the picture I take half a minute from now most likely will be almost identical. So it's dependent samples that we're talking about. It's not independently nicely sampled um, as in the academic setting. <coughs> and finally, what can happen is that um, the distribution you're talking about at prediction time is doesn't have to be a fixed one. It can change over time. So these are pictures I took during different vacation trips or conference trips. Um, so in the beginning, I guess I was in Barcelona, and then I entered a plane, and the next picture I took was on the Easter Island. So clearly the distribution of object you see at one location and at the other location will have changed. So it's not a fixed setting which is constant all forever, but distributions change and we have to be able to adapt to that. So that is a, is a situation where the distribution where we want to apply our classifier is not stationary. So these are three real situations that we might have to deal with um, and they are not reflected in the typical IID setting of, of, of research. <coughs> Okay, so let me um, summarize this, that in real examples, we will have dependent samples. So um, there is temporal dependencies, and there might be um, specific dependencies between samples um, in the collection of images that we want to classify. Um, so <coughs> here's an example of a picture, and typically when you talk about dependent data, you think of it as... Um, that is a nuisance to my training. I don't want dependent data, I want independent data. I would like to argue that having dependent data should be a blessing, not a nuisance. Um, and this is the example um, of, a, of a picture I want to classify. If anyone can immediately guess what it is, typically it's very obvious that it's a shop. Ah, that's very good, high-quality screen. So you might even see which kind of shop it is. But when I give you additional images that were captured around the same time, you will immediately see this must have been a bakery. Right? Because there's bread around, there's macarons, um, and there's a baker. So the additional images that you also were supposed to classify can act as context, as additional information for the decision that I'm after now. <coughs> so this is the observation we want to build on in order to get better classifiers. That dependent data can be a blessing and can help us by acting as context. <coughs> okay, so let me introduce a little bit of mutation. Um, I will talk in mathematical terms about images as samples from a distribution which I call X. So X will from now on denote any kind of image. And the task is to predict labels, and the labels I will denote as Y. So just think of them as any number between 1 and K if I have a classification problem. with. And then there's this distinction between how was the data distributed, what data occurred at training time, and what data occurs at actual prediction time and I will call the distribution at, of training data at training time by P of X and Y, and the distribution at prediction time is Q of X and Y. Um, so the domain shift I talked about before just means that these distributions are not the same. So P of X, Y is not the same as Q of X, Y. <coughs> so this can have different reasons, right? Um, and the typical three cases that you could identify why distribution chains between training time and prediction time <coughs> Well, you can check how your distribution factorizes and then, I mean, separate them into classes. The first class would be that um, the distribution of um, labels given an input. So if I have a fixed image, which classes could this be? That might be the same before, between training and prediction time, but the distribution of which images I actually see, this could have changed. So the conditional distribution of labels given inputs could have been the same but the distribution marginally of just which inputs I'm exposed to, this would change. That's the very classic assumption in machine learning. It's called the covariate shift assumption. And it's also a very boring and uninteresting uh, for us because if your distribution of which classes you see, um, which classes are possible for an image, how likely they are doesn't change, well, since our classifiers are trained discriminatively, as long as they are good, across the board on all the classes, I mean, across the images at training time, the distribution we need for prediction doesn't change at prediction time. So the joint distribution changes, but the relevant part doesn't. So this is not a problem we'll actually have to deal with in practice. <coughs> the next thing that can happen is um, so-called appearance shift. That means the appearance of images changes 
um, between training and test time. So an apple looks different at training time than it does at test time. Um, so that would mean the conditional distribution of the inputs, the axis, given the label, would be different between training and prediction. Um, this used to be a big problem already when you just changed the resolution of your image or when the lighting condition changed, you might have different features extracted from the image. But luckily, that is not so much the case anymore. So ever since the deep features came out with um, the original cafe and so on, um, features are pretty much invariant to different conditions. So this is a visualization from an earlier paper um, <coughs> where on the left you see uh, surf features, which are something like sift features that you might remember. Um, and there's two viewing conditions, the green and the blue. And you can see in the, in the crop outs that things that are close together between green and blue might not necessarily be of the same object. So features looked similar, but they weren't the same thing. Or features were very different, but they were of the same thing. So that's not good. That would mean your appearance of objects really changes between training and prediction. On the right, you see the situation with um, these deeper features. And by now, of course, there has been even more development in feature extraction using neural networks. And you see that this is really mitigated. So things that are close together, no matter if they came from one or from the other situation, no matter if they're green or blue, um, they express the same object. So if it's the same object, the appearance will also be similar. So again, this effect that the features change between training and prediction, we can also rule out. <coughs> so what's left? What's left is that the appearance of object doesn't change. So p of x given y is the same as q as x given y. But just which objects show up, that might change. And that is a situation that is definitely present. As we said in the beginning, um, we might go from a situation where all classes are there to a situation where just cucumbers are there. So that is an um, effect that is definitely uh, there to stay. <coughs> so this is the domain shift we're going to talk about. At training time, we have a certain number of classes and a certain ratio of how frequent these classes are. That's the P of Y. And typically, in most machine learning things, we try to work on more or less balanced data. So if we have k different classes, the probability of each class is roughly the same. Um, maybe going up or down by a few percent, but um, not extremes. <coughs> For example, if you go to the, uh, one of the ImageNet data sets, you will see that it contains as many volcanoes as it contains cucumbers, as it contains zebras. So classes are pretty much balanced. And there's good reasons for that, because that means you see enough of every object class at training time. Um, so that makes training more efficient. <coughs> at prediction time, the probability of classes will be different. So the Q of Y, the probability of seeing any specific object at, at prediction time, will depend strongly on the situation. In the supermarket, you will see fruit, no volcanoes. Um, at the airport, you see people and baggage, but no volcanoes, hopefully. Um, in vacation, you occasionally might see a volcano, but there's way more beaches than volcanoes in the world. So it's going to be a very imbalanced distribution. It will concentrate on some classes which are currently of interest, um, and others will be almost impossible to occur. Um, so you might see that as a nuisance, but I would say this is an advantage. So if you have a distribution of classes which is peaked around a few options, that is a low entropy distribution, and it should be much easier to learn. The worst thing to learn is if your distribution is completely flat and normalized and you have no clue what to say except by additional information from the image. <coughs> so my point would be this shift in class probabilities is a real effect. We cannot pretend it's not there. But it could be beneficial to us. It should help us that we are now working with a much more peak distribution than with a completely uniform high entropy distribution. <coughs> okay. So we developed one method that builds on this in order to improve object classification. And this is work by my student, Emily. Um, and it was published last CVPR called Classifier Adaptation at Prediction Time. So we start from exactly the observation I made. Um, we want to take pre-trained classifiers from industry or somebody, and we want to adapt them to a new situation at prediction time where the ratio of classes might be very different. <coughs> So again, a little bit of notation. Let's assume at training time, um, industry did a really good job, and they trained more or less the optimal multi-class classifier. Uh, let's call it f. So a classifier is a function from x to y, uh, from inputs to labels. And let's assume that it's a probabilistic classifier. So the classifier 
um, has components and it predicts for each class a possible component. So we write this with index, so we would have this f of y, that should be the probability that the image x contains the object y, or at least it should be proportional to it, it doesn't have to be exactly the probability. And then how do you predict which object out of many? Well, you just take the class that is most likely, so the actual classifier would pick the, the highest element in it. At prediction time, we also want a, cl a classifier, hopefully also the optimal one. Um, but now, of course, it should be optimal for the distribution at prediction time, not for the distribution at training time. So again, we will have a classifier, let's call it G, and it will have components, and the components G index Y will be the pro uh, should be proportional to the probability that we see a certain object in a certain image um, at prediction time instead of at training time. <coughs> so now we can make use of our assumption that how does the distribution change between training and prediction? We know that the marginal probabilities of, um, label of classes change. P of Y is not the same as Q of Y. But the appearance of object doesn't change. So P of X given Y is the same as Q of X given Y. And now comes everybody's favorite formula, um, Bayes' rule. Oh, actually, that isn't Bayes' rule yet, sorry. Um, oh, yes, it is, twice. I use Bayes' rule twice. And what I end up with is we can actually express the probability of the conditional probability of any label at prediction time, um, given an image x, as the following ratio. We need the probability at training time, and then we multiply it with some marginal probabilities, so the probability of the labels, um, the probability of the images themselves, normalized again by the probability of labels and images at the opposite situation. And since in the end we just care about proportional factors, we can also write this as just the old classifier's output on a certain class, multiplied with the ratio of the probability at training time, uh, at prediction time divided by training time. <coughs> so we've just proved more or less that the optimal classifier at prediction time will be a classifier building on the old classifier's output, but scaled by a certain number, by a multiplicative factor. <coughs> So if you want, you can write that formally, and you will get the, um, how to take a classifier F and adapt it to a new situation. I call that the class prior adapted, um, class prior adapted classifier, I guess. Um, so if the true proportions at training times are rho, and just as a shorthand notation, and the true proportions at prediction time are pi, then the new classifier will just be F times pi over rho. <coughs> So we get the optimal classifier without retraining anything. We don't have to look inside of the neural net. Nobody has to give us the source code or the parameters of our classifiers. It's enough to have the executable that outputs the probabilities. We rescale it by the right factors, and we have the optimal classifier for the prediction time. A very simple rule, um, essentially probability theory 101, or calculus. <coughs> OK, so what is the problem here? Nobody gives us the class proportionate prediction time. I mean, if you are a shop owner, how would you know what the class proportions of cucumbers in your store is? Um, or how, I mean, not even the class proportions of uh, cucumbers in your store, but people taking picture of them, right? So how many pi pictures of cucumbers will the user do compared to the, uh, the pictures of tomatoes? So this is not accessible to you in any form, right? So, this would be completely done, we would be done, I mean, the talk would be over if we would have these class proportions, but we don't. So what do we do? We estimate these class proportions on the fly while applying our classifier. <coughs> so this is the problem. Class proportions are known. This is the solution. Learn the proportions while doing the predictions on the fly. <coughs> so now we have some kind of iterative scenario where we're classifying images one after the other, and we want to adapt our um, class proportions over time. And now we can distinguish between different scenarios depending on what kind of feedback is available to us, what information is provided to us. Um, so there's three possible scenarios. One is the so-called online feedback. Whenever the classifier makes a decision, it gets told what the correct label for this image would have been. So after you predict a label, the true label is revealed. There's a so-called bandit setting, where the classifier makes a prediction, 
and afterwards it is told if it was correct or not. If it wasn't correct, it's not told what the correct answer would have been, but it's at least told that it was wrong. And finally, there's the completely unsupervised setting where there's no feedback whatsoever. The classifier just makes one decision after the other and has to deal with it. All of these are not completely unrealistic. So if you think of the, the cash register uh, system, there might be a person sitting behind the desk. There's an automatic camera scanning the products, but the person controls and checks that if there is a mistake, it's actually corrected. So it's possible that um, the, every time the classifier makes a mistake, it, the mistake is automatically corrected, in that case by a person. And that's still more efficient than not having an automatic system to do the scanning. In the bandit situation, um, the bandit situation is, is more appealing in a sense because the only feedback the classifier gets is one bit of information, correct or incorrect. And people are much more willing to give like one bit of information than to, have to specify in advance which out of a thousand products this was. So you might think of an um, augmented reality system that runs around and it shows you who are you currently talking to. It's the name of the person, very useful. Um, but then you might correct it with the click on your smartphone. That was wrong. So with a little tap, you would correct the system and provide feedback to it. And of course, the unsupervised scenario is, is ubiquitous. Every surveillance camera that doesn't have a person checking the images immediately would be an unsupervised system. <coughs> OK, so I'm going to introduce the, in these three settings, we will estimate the class probabilities on the fly, and the mechanism will be very similar. Um, so <coughs> first, let me give you an example how this um, feedback mechanism will actually work. So I mentioned you are given an image like this one. Now the classifier will have an opinion which class is how likely. So in this case, it will think it's 80% class uh, chance it's a cat, 10% it's a dog or a truck. I mean, this is a simplified example. So it predicts the highest value, cat. Um, and now, depending on the scenario, you will get different feedbacks. Right? So in the online setting, it will tell you cat, because it is a cat. In the bandit setting, it will be correct. Your decision was correct. And in the no feedback, well, it wouldn't get anything. Okay? So in the next image, that's a dog. It would have an opinion that this might be a dog, or it turns out it's more thinking it's a truck. Maybe it was confused by the car in the background. Um, so the online feedback would tell you dog. The bandit feedback would tell you this was a mistake, and the no feedback wouldn't tell you anything, etc. So if you don't make a mistake, they are all pretty much um, the same. If you do make a mistake, like here, the bandit feedback says you something, the online feedback says you something. So this is the three scenarios that we want to be able to handle. OK. <coughs> Let's how do we cl estimate class prior probabilities at all? So imagine we are given the true labels. So if we have examples and labels, how do we estimate the class proportions? Well, as you estimate probabilities in general, you count how often a certain class occurs and you divide by the total number of examples you've seen. Um, what we're going to do is a slightly different version of that. We're going to do a smooth maximum likelihood instead of the maximum likelihood that I did be, uh, explained before. You can also think of it as a Bayesian estimator with a Dirichlet prior. Um, so you count how often a certain label occurs. So at time t, this quantity counts how often did label y occur so far. Um, and then instead of dividing by the number of steps so far, you add a little constant to it, and you divide by the corresponding normalization. Um, <coughs> and you can think of that as a smoothing of the estimate. Or you can think of it as a, as a Bayesian version that doesn't believe the data too much. And the main reason to prefer this over the maximum likelihood estimator that just counts is um, if you've never seen an object class before, maybe you've just seen five images, and I mean there were just were no cats in there, then the maximum likelihood would say there's zero probability of seeing a cat, and that doesn't seem right. So just because we saw, didn't see one yet doesn't mean it should be impossible to ever happen. So this Bayesian estimator is more conservative. It always assigns at least a small probability of seeing everything. <coughs> okay, so now how do we actually estimate these in the online feedback setting? Well, the online feedback setting is almost as good as the perfectly informed. You have all the correct labels except for the last one. So you can just compute this ratio or this Bayesian estimator um, in, uh, based on everything you've seen so far up to the step t minus 1. <coughs> and you don't even always have to start counting at the first and go to the last step. You can estimate these counts, of course, incrementally. So if you have seen 
things a certain number of times so far. Now you see another one. You only have to increase the one element that corresponds to the C in class by one. So you have an incremental estimate where the count at time t um, is the count at the previous time step plus a one at the location of what you've actually seen. So I will use this brackets notation to say uh, it's one if there's a um, true condition inside and a zero if there's not a true condition inside. So here, all of the elements will stay the same. All elements of this vector nt stay the same, except for the one that corresponds to yt. That one is increased. <coughs> and now, the law of large number will tell you that this kind of estimate converges to the true distribution. And not just for, uh, typically, you think of law of large number for independent samples, but it also holds for dependent samples under very weak condition. So this thing will converge to the true class distributions. So that's a good thing. <coughs> Here's the corresponding example with a cat. So you start with a prior of class distributions, which is up here. And in the beginning, of course, you have absolutely no information. So in the first step, every class is equally likely. Now you get your image, <coughs> you get your predictions, um, you compute the adapted classifier based on the original classifier. I call that G, which I compute from the pre-trained F. Um, turns out it doesn't change because the prior has no opinion. Um, so then the maximum over the adapted classifier is still cat. That feedback tells you it's indeed a cat. And you update your estimate of the class proportions for the cat by one, because now you've seen one cat. So the new class proportions is, ah, the new class proportions is a little bit higher for the cat now than for the other two, because you've seen a cat, so you believe that cats actually exist in the world. <coughs> so here's the next image. The pre-trained classifier gives you the same scores as it always did. Um, now you adapt the scores according to your prior, and your prior is not completely uniform anymore, so it will raise the probability of cat a little bit uh, and lower the probability of the others. Um, but the maximum is still where it was, at the truck, so which is still a mistake. So it will give feedback dog, dog, and as an update, it will increase the probability of seeing dogs because, well, it now knows that there is actually a dog. Oh, there was a dog. <coughs> so these are the changed um, priors. Now cats and dogs are more likely than trucks. You do the same thing. You have the pre-trained classifier, the adapted classifier. The prediction is the maximum of the Gs. Um, feedback says you were right. Dogs are even more likely in the prior, and so on. And eventually, <coughs> you have the situation again where the pre-trained classifier was wrong. Maybe it was confused by the boxy shape, and it thinks trucks are more likely than dogs and cats here. <coughs> but the adaptation will actually fix that, because by now, after these five steps, it has learned that cats and dogs have a higher probability of occurring than trucks. So it will adjust the probabilities accordingly, according to Bayes' rule. And now it has actually fixed the wrong prediction of the Bayes classifier to be the right prediction of the adapted classifier, and so on and so on. And that way, by learning the correct class probabilities, the classifier can actually fix mistakes that the pre-trained classifier, uh, regardless of how many GPUs were used to train it, it might be fixable. <coughs> so that's the online feedback. Online feedback, in a sense, is easy. Right? You're, I mean, you're getting all the information you need just one step delayed. Um, it's more interesting to look at the other feedback scenarios. So bandit feedback. Um, now there's two situations. You make a prediction. And either this prediction was correct or it was wrong. If it was correct, well, then you know what the correct class is. Right? You, do, you just increase the count of the correct class, and everything is the same as in the full uh, supervision feedback. If your decision was incorrect, you don't know what is the correct class. You only know that it's not the one you predicted. So the most conservative thing you can do is you just make the counts of the other classes bigger by 1 over k minus 1. So k is the total number. It's not the one you predicted, so there's k minus 1 left. All of them you increase by 1 over k minus 1. Yes, please. Why do you add n divided by k minus 1 instead of output of power plus n? Um, that's the bottom line. You can also do that. Um, you can also do that. Um, that means you trust your classifier because you use its predictions for yourself. Um, it will work very similarly. We didn't see a big uh, difference. This is the more conservative estimate because you do not assume that your classifier is correct at this stage. Uh, but yes, both makes total sense. But it, it assumes that uh, the distribution is uniform with respect to all other classes, which might not be true. 
well, it's the maximum entropy thing you can assume about distribution that is uniform, right? So it's the most conservative estimate. I don't want to assign too little weight to the true class, but yes, it's, I mean, you, ma you need to make some design decision, and either you do, like, everything is equal. I d if I don't know anything, I don't assume anything. Or you say, if I don't know, except that it's not the one I predicted, I trust my previously learned things, and then I would use the distribution at the bottom. If you prefer that, feel free to use the one at the bottom, which is trusting your classifier prediction so far. Um, the numbers will not change compared, I mean, or at least not very much. Sorry, so again. Uh, why, do we, why do we still use the original classifier out without any exploration in order to like converge to greater uh, well, to converge quicker to the uh, well to, to the priors? Like um, if our classifier constantly mistakes plus one for plus two, then we'll get the uh, output for plus one much slower. But we could, for example, uh, deliberately uh, try assigning uh, assigning plus one to what we think plus two. So you would say intentionally class one, even though the classifier think it's class two. Uh, but that will, I mean, it, the, it's not this, if, if you would, okay, if you could probe the same example multiple times, you could do exploration. So you get an image, you classify it wrong, so maybe you do try again with a different class. Or maybe if you have 10 choices to guess, you could try guess in order to explore the space of all classes or so. I don't think that works if you have a new image every time. But it will just be wrong more often. So this is really more the online setting where you want to be right, right? This is a system that runs in a shop. You don't intentionally want to be wrong, right? So yes, if you had some kind of reinforcement system or on banded online learning, and you want to identify the correct arm, in this setting, exploration makes sense. But here, I don't think it's it's this kind of it's not a true banded setting. It's a banded feedback setting. So, but maybe we can discuss it on offline afterwards. <coughs> okay, so. This is the, the rule we use in order to update our class beliefs based on banded feedback. Um, so here's the corresponding example. I'm not going to animate it, but um, I'm going to show it to you anyway. We start with the same situation before. We have a cat. There's no beliefs about the priors. So um, at the very end, we make a decision. And this decision is correct. And because the decision is correct, the classifier knows what is the correct class, so we increase the count for the correct class. In the next one, we make the wrong decision, so we increase the probability of seeing the other two classes, or of having seen the other classes two, so far by one half each, and that changes our prior <coughs> now to one half more than before divided by the new thing, um, et cetera, et cetera. So our prior converges more slowly because it doesn't always take the full step to the true class. Sometimes it just takes half a step towards the true class or 1 over k minus 1. Uh, and it also goes a little bit to the ones we might be the right class, we don't know. <coughs> but in this example, it still worked and it fixed the last mistake because it, it raised the dog enough in order to beat the truck. <coughs> Finally, there's the unsupervised feedback situation where you really get no information whatsoever if your correct decisions were correct. And now there's really not much we can do. We cannot increase all classes equally because then, I mean, we wouldn't learn anything. It would stay equal forever. So now we actually trust our predictions so far. It's like the only thing we can do. So <coughs> we still c keep account how often we saw each class so far. But these counts are the output of our, our model, which classes we think we saw so far which, of course, the image information has entered. So if we're very confident we saw a cat here, then we will increase the count for cats a little more. If we're very non-confident that we saw a certain class, we increase it less. Um, so we update our current belief of how, many, um, how often we saw a certain class by, well, the expected value of having seen that class under our current model distribution. So this is automatically normalized to 1, and we compute it from the classifier outputs in the usual way as just a sum divided by the total count. Um, 
There's no guarantee that this will converge to anything reasonable, because if our classifier is completely wrong in the beginning, well, it will just get more and more wrong, because we trust its output to some extent. Not hard, but at least in a soft way. Um, but it turns out, if we have a reasonable pre-trained classifiers, and I mean, we wouldn't buy them from Google or Yandex if they weren't good, right? If we have a reasonable set of base classifiers that are more often right than wrong, this actually works surprisingly good. <coughs> okay, so here's the corresponding example. Um, at every step, we have our current estimate of which classes occur, and we increase our class priors eh, by this corresponding amount. And again, the priors about classes changes over time, um, slowly, because we're never I mean, in the online setting, we have like we add one on zeros. Here we add whatever our beliefs are, which is a little closer to to I mean uniform, unless we are very very certain based on the classifier. Um, but still, after a while, the scores um, of the prior influence our decision, and hopefully they influence them in the right way, and we make fewer mistakes. <coughs> okay, so now in the very beginning, I also said there might not be a stationary distribution, so we might change distributions when we travel from one continent to the other, or maybe the, um, may if that thing is built into my smartphone, then of course the distribution of classes I see in the shop is a different one than the classes of distributions I see here. So what if there is no true distribution of classes to converge to? Um, well, the easiest is to just think of this not as a global running forever process, but as an adaptive process over time. So you can just put a sliding window and you just do the statistics of like the last 100 images you've seen. So then 100 images later, you will have forgotten everything you saw in the past, and you will have a new estimate of just the last window that you've seen. Um, this cannot converge to the true thing anymore because it doesn't, I mean, it always has access to just a small finite number of data. But then if we assume that there is this non-stationary distribution, and I mean, the distribution might change any time, then there is nothing to converge to anyway. So we can try to track the distribution as closely as possible, and we just have to choose a good window size. And for example, 100 worked for us, but this is, com I mean, this is completely domain dependent. Uh, if you expect that the distribution changes just once a year, you can use a bigger size. If you change, expect it to change often, you would need to choose a smaller. So you can also think of other things like exponential decaying, that you trust your past less than your um, the recent past, more than the distant past, and so on. Um, for simplicity, we just use this window. <coughs> okay, so now comes the interesting part. We have built a classifier that adapts to the data distribution. Um, now we have to benchmark it. We have to show that it actually works. Right? I can build a lot of systems, but most of them will not work. So how do we benchmark a system that can adapt to a changing distribution with dependent samples? Um, for that, we need image sequences, which actually look more or less like the pictures I would take with my smartphone. Right? So they should not be uniformly class distributed. They should have dependence between samples. And they might have a non-stationary distribution, where now I see this, and next week I see something else. Uh, turns out it's not that there are any standard benchmarks for that out there. This is more or less the opposite of what the standard benchmarks are. How do you create a standard benchmark like ImageNet? You collect a lot of images from the web. And then in order to really, really guarantee that there is no dependence between samples and everything is independent, you randomly shuffle it. And you split your data completely at random between training and test. This would not make sense here. <coughs> so we proposed three methods for creating sequences that look similar to this. And because we do not want to lose the ability to compare to other methods that were trained, for example, on ImageNet and evaluated on ImageNet, we, uh, these methods ba are based on an existing IID corpus. So we want to create sequences of images with certain dependencies based on a data set that otherwise would be have, uh, that doesn't have any independences otherwise, uh, dependencies otherwise. <coughs> so the first two methods are based on a hidden Markov structure that I will tell you about. The second, or the third in that sense, is the one I like best. It's based on natural language. Um, so I will talk about these um, to give you an impression. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create dependence between samples in a sequence by sampling images, um, but not randomly from the set of all possible images, but only from certain classes. And which classes that is, is according to a random walk. So we take the classes that ImageNet, the data set has. So it has a certain hierarchical structure. 
we project that into two-dimensional space, and you get a graph so that gives you the uh, red dots, and then you do a k-nearest neighbor graph on them, and you get a picture like this one. So this is, of course, just a small crop out of the 1,000 classes that we have used in this case. <coughs> so now what you're going to do is you're going to do a random walk on this graph. So you start, for example, as the Eskimo dog, then you move to the Tibetan Mastiff. From there, you move to the Dalmatian. You might stay at the Dalmatian, so it's a random walk where you can stay where you are. Then you go maybe back to the Tibetan. Then you go to the German Shepherd, Border Collie, Boxer, back to the Border Collie, and so on. A random walk on the nodes of this graph, completely uniform between the neighbors and the current. <coughs> so the structure that this has, um, it turns out that this multidimensional scaling creates some kind of semantic clusters. So the neighborhood graph you will get means that if you take a random walk, you will stay with related classes for a while. So if you start in a dog, you will most likely visit another dog next. There's always a chance that you go over to the next and now you have a panda, but it's typically that it moves around in semantically similar uh, space for a while. And now we create an image sequence from this, but for every class that we visit, we sample one image. So there's a chance that we first see a couple of dogs, then it moves over to a raccoon, or not, and so on. So this clearly creates a sequence of dependent images. If you've seen a dog, there's a good chance you'll see another dog next. <coughs> the second method works in the same way. We again create a graph, but now we use a different methods for creating a graph. It's kernelized sorting, where we just force all the classes to lie on a grid um, in a way such that similar classes are next to each other, but there's no of these like focused clusters anymore. But everything has the same number of neighbors, um, and everything has the same distance to each other. Now, if you do a random walk in this, you will still have semantically similar things next to each other, but it will not like stay in one region for a while, but it most likely will just walk around space, um, and you have very quickly changing topics. <coughs> um, all of these would have like continuously changing, right? You might not have any jumps. So we also introduced the option of jumps. Uh, we introduced the parameter lambda, and we just, at every step, instead of doing a random walk step, we go with probability lambda to an arbitrary uh, node in the graph. So that means we basically stop a certain subsequences of semantically similar things, and we just start a new one at a random location. So the effect is, if you want, that we have sampled smooth subsequences of topics of variable length, the probability lambda tells us how likely is it to start a new subsequence. So if your, if your lambda is 0.1, you can expect on average 10 steps before it changes. Okay, the third one to generate images is based on the observation that we already have sources of nice dependent sequences, and that is text. So if you read a book, the words are not sampled IID, right? They come in a certain order, and the order reflects really how we interact with the world. If you have a, um, if you have a, a dialogue or some kind of action in a book, that means, well, you take a knife and then you do something with the knife, so the knife is described maybe more than once, then you stab someone, well, don't, but something happens, the person replies, you reply, so there's an interaction, and it can be an interaction between objects that are not completely obviously related. So, um, it's not that only semantically similar things occur next to each other, but any kind of things that co-occur might also co-occur in text. <coughs> so we wanted to use that in order to create image sequences. So what we did is we used a large corpus of English text from the project Gutenberg. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, it's a great online resource of um, e-books, um, freely to use, ASCII form, very easy to process for your own experiments. Um, and then what we want to generate is we want to keep um, only the words that corresponds to classes we actually care about. So first we suppress all, everything that is not a noun, because we only care about nouns. <coughs> and then we scan the noun sequence for only the class names that occur in the, in the ImageNet class that we want to classify, or for more general expressions. So some of the classes in ImageNet are very specific, like Tibetan Mastiff. Not very many books talk about that. So we also search for the superclasses, the hypernyms, so which in this case would be certain kind of dog, and then eventually it finds the word dog in the hierarchy. So if we find the word dog in the English text, we would randomly sample a class from the leaves that are part of the ImageNet hierarchy. So if we find the word dog in the text, we would sample, for example, the Mastiff image. <coughs> and 
And that way we make sure that even the most obscure classes at least have a chance of occurring. So here's an example from Alice in Wonderland, um, the original text in the beginning. And you see that the word rabbit and watch are classes that we care about. So the, the sequence of classes will be rabbit, watch, nothing, 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 rabbit, watch. And these are not two classes that would be similar in any kind of hierarchy of ImageNet in the previous graph. But if a rabbit interacts with a watch, these are things that might alternate also in the real world. So if you see a, a movie of Alice in Wonderland now, it has a good chance that you will see alternating shots of rabbits and watches. <coughs> so here's example images of that. So the first one is exactly the Alice in Wonderland sequence. You see, a, uh, we sample an image of a rabbit, then an image of a watch, an image of a rabbit, an image of a watch, a rabbit, rabbit, and so on. Um, the second one is the graph-based method that has dense clusters. And as you can see, it really stays with some um, vegetables for a while, or jalapenos. Um, the kernelized sorting, locally you have some kind of similarity, like from the nematode to the sea cucumber, but it really quickly changes and suddenly there's a leopard and then so on. And the fourth one um, we include, that would be completely randomly sampled without any structure. So um, just by accident there's a speedboat on the coral reef, but then there's a burrito. And so this is what the usual test set of, an, of a classifying challenge would look like completely randomly sampled images in no particular order. And we include that because our goal is to adapt to the structure of the sequence, but it might happen that there is no structure, and then, of course, we want to check how badly are we doing in that case. <coughs> okay, so here are some experiments. Um, there's a lot of uh, information, so let me drop most of them. So I'm only going to tell you about uh, one of the two data sets. I'm only going to tell you about experiments using neural network classifiers, not the SVMs. Um, and then, well, we have um, tested this on different sequences, 100 of each of the ones I explained to you, so 100 based on the graph and that with different jump probabilities, 100 of the other graph method and different jump probabilities, 100 of the text, and 100 of purely random sequences. Um, for the generated sequences, we can freely pick how long they are. Um, for the text, we don't have that choice. The text just has a certain length. In fact, it ended up with between 400 and 20,000 samples. The average was 3,400, so we made the other ones also in that rough uh, size. So all the other sequences are generated to be 3,000 samples long. <coughs> and we evaluate this using the typical measure for ImageNet classifiers, so that's how many of the top five predictions are correct, the so-called top five error. <coughs> Here's a table with numbers. Let me guide you through this. We start first with online feedback. So we applied this adaptive classifier or the non-adaptive classifier and see how well it does with online feedback. So the first thing to look at is the column with the CNN, that's the convolutional neural network, without any adaptation. So this is the classic AlexNet network, which happens to have an error rate of roughly 17%. Um, and you can see that, well, it still has that. So the data we generated from um, the ImageNet images, um, if you have a classifier that doesn't care about dependence, well, it's still the same samples, it will still have the same error rate. Um, turns out the text sequences might be a little bit harder, but it's hard to say because of all the, the error bars. <coughs> um, so that just means the, cla the, the classifier sequence or the uh, evaluation sequences we created are roughly as hard as the original data set if you just look at one image at a time. In particular, when you look at the random at the bottom, that is just the original test set. Now, if you switch on adaptation, we have two choices. We either switch on the, the adaptation all the time, or we do the version that looks only at a window at a time, because it, there might be changes. And we can see two regimes. So the middle column is if we just have constant adaptation, and the last one if you have adaptation over a window. And we can see that the numbers qu change quite a bit. So for the text sequences and the graph-based method with clusters, which had a very low jump probability or no jump probability at all, so it will mainly stay locally until it moves away, but uh, you have dense clusters of similar classes. Just switching on the adaptation cuts the error maybe by, well, 60% uh, down. So it goes from 16 to 5% plus minus the error bars. <coughs> and even if the probability of random jumps to completely new regions of the space, um, you might still benefit from adaptation. Um, if the probability of jumping somewhere else in the class space is too big, well, maybe don't use the complete adaptation anymore because it will get distracted 
um, and use the dynamic one. And in fact, I would rather recommend to you always use the dynamic one. Uh, it's not that big a difference between 5% and 6%. So this kind of Windows approach is the more robust thing to use in practice, I would say. <coughs> and even that gives you a decent boost. So for the ho often new starting sequences, you get a, a nice redu reduction. And in the second setting of the KS, that was the graph-based method, which is a grid, um, there the topics change much quicker, so it's much faster to go from one topic to the other. Still, you get a decent improvement from 16 to 11%. Finally, there is the last. So what if you do apply it to something that doesn't have a structure, but you still try to find the structure? Well, it will try to overfit to a non-existing structure, and it will make the error a little bit worse. And in fact, the adaptation uh, makes it maybe significantly worse. The dynamic one that only looks at the window will not be distracted so much. So that's the main reason why I would recommend to use this windowed approach. Um, even in the case where there's nothing, it will not do too badly. But if there is structure, it will do fine. But how do you find the length of your slide? It's 100. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have a prior knowledge. We thought 100 is a good number. <laughs> um, it's, not, it's not model selected to work well on this at all. I mean, clearly this, I mean, if you, if you have certain prior knowledge about your, your structure, how often the distribution might change, oh, maybe you can observe that. Sure, but that's cheating, right? It's, I mean, it's not that you know what, I mean, okay, so I should say that all of these are synthetic sequences. So if you know how they were generated, you can easily cheat. So, for example, the MDS and KS, these are Markov chains. So instead of learning the class priors, you might say, oh, let's learn transition probabilities. And you will perfectly recover the graph, and you will not, I mean, you have perfectly beaten the benchmark. And that's not the point, right? It's not that we want to beat the benchmark. We want to build a method that can actually adapt. And these are just exemplary method of building dependent data. So we intentionally don't use like transition and higher order or so. We just very conservatively count how often we have seen what before. I wouldn't know how to benchmark or how to cheat on the text sequences easily because they're very obscure. But um, yeah, so you have to be, uh, you have to be a bit careful that you don't overfit your method to the data. So in first, first there's the method, then there's the data generation process here. Um, where? Ah, for the KS. <coughs> this one. Um, our, our interpretation is that in this grid, you very quickly move around. So things you've seen, there's a lower chance of seeing it again. I mean, this adaptation of priors basically works that if you've seen something, it's more likely to reoccur. That if you have a random walk and you have a low chance of coming back, it might be, you should better forget what you've seen a long, long time ago because you're far away by now. That is our explanation. Okay, but seriously, this is online feedback. You almost have perfect information, right? So it gets, uh, it gets more challenging if you, you don't have online feedback, but you only have uh, the banded feedback where you get told your mistakes. And the nice thing is it still works. So the numbers are a little bit higher if you can check, right? From 5.2 to 6.1, uh, from 9 to 11. So because you have weaker feedback, it doesn't work that well anymore but it still works well, and the pattern is the same. The dynamic adaptation gives you a boost if there is. At least it doesn't lose if there is structure. And if it loses, the, lo the loss in the purely random situation is actually small. And finally, what we were most happy about is the unsupervised setting. Here it is. You still win. Why is that? Well, we get a pretty good base classifier, right? It's already 75%, well, the top prediction is not 75% correct. But at least in 50% of cases, the top prediction is actually correct. So in those cases, you will perfectly predict the right thing now. Um, and overall, it still pushes you to the right direction in order to make fewer mistakes. So again, we have the same pattern. We get an improvement, especially if the situation is easy and things are nice and moving around. If the situation is harder and changing very rapidly, um, we still get a certain improvement from adapting, at least on the, on the windowed scale. <coughs> OK, so that is my summary. Um, I'm a strong believer that I will never, ever train an ImageNet classifier again. I will just buy it. Um, 
which clearly creates new research problems, not how to most efficiently train your neural network, but what to do with the trained classifiers afterwards. Um, I think there's also a certain problem in academia that um, it's very nice to study IID uniform image situations. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of learning theory. You can actually prove things about these situations. But if we want computer vision to enter the real world, to be, I mean, have users, actually people, not just scientists use it, um, we cannot hope that data is IID. My smartphone images are definitely not IID. So we have to deal with class imbalance, with dependence between samples, with non-stationary distributions. Um, typically, these are nuisances. I think they are I mean, an opportunity to develop new methods and benefit from them. Um, what I showed you is classifier adaptation on the time, basically using Bayes' rule and, adapt and estimating which classes occur how often. Um, one thing I like about it is that it's really not about neural networks or SVMs or whatever the next big thing is. Um, all we need is base classifiers and their output, hopefully probabilistic. Um, so we don't have to ask Amazon, whoever provides us the classifier, to give us the pre-trained networks with their parameters and so on. I mean, they will not give us their parameters. That's a trade secret. But the output, that's a different story. <coughs> and that um, gave you three methods for creating dependent test image sequences, which are hopefully more realistic as a test bed than um, completely randomly sampled, uniformly shuffled test sequences. Um, the results we saw, online adaptation works. It can reduce the error rate sometimes substantially. So if your situation is easy with like repeating patterns, um, it, there was a decent boost. And that is for all three kinds of feedback. Clearly for online feedback where you have full information, but also for um, banded feedback where you just get one bit of information, and even for the unsupervised case, as long as your base classifiers are reasonable. Um, and that's it. Let me thank my group at IST Austria, in particular Amelie, who did all this work, our funding sources of IST and the ERC. And let me thank you for um, coming and listening. I still have a few minutes for questions, I think. Yes, that was very spontaneous. If you're a shop owner with groceries, you will never build your own classifier. If I'm a shop owner, I will then never be able to <laughs> do this. No, this is built in. This is, I mean, you buy a camera, it's built in. I mean, you wouldn't, right? I mean, what, I mean, an automatic cash register scans an image and outputs what, what fruit did you buy. It doesn't matter if it, if you, um, yeah, but that doesn't mean that there's a GPU in the cache register that will actually retrain the classifier because, I mean, nobody gives you the source code of the classifier in the first place and so on. So it's very easy to have, like, the values internally and multiply them with other numbers. That doesn't cost anything. But I don't think you will be able to just retrain or fine-tune your network in real life ever. I don't think that's, I mean, even now it's not realistic anymore. You cannot build a GPU into every smartphone. Um, not in the s experiments we did. I mean, of course, there is. I mean, there is an error, right? There is an error going down. For random sequences, it goes. I mean, it gets a little bit worse, right? It's, it's clearly imaginable if your base classifiers are bad that it will be completely bad. Um, we didn't observe that most likely because our base classifiers are good. So not just the neural network, also the SVM, which has a higher error rate overall, it still helped there. The numbers are in the paper. Um, I haven't checked because I didn't think there's hope for it. Um, maybe there's this good trick, but I mean, it will depend on your classifier as well, right? If, you, if you're always wrong, it will just homogeneously make everything higher. So I don't think there's hope to show that it's consistent, but maybe I'm wrong. That would be very nice. In the binary setting, it is because then being wrong is automatically the opposite of being right, but that's cheating. Um, and the same maybe for, uh, you said that there is no guarantee for the unsupervised case. Yes. Um, uh, maybe there is similar approaches if you put some additional assumption on the equality of the two of these equal to the fixed case. 
I doubt it, because the unsupervised really is based on your classifier. So you use your classifier as truth somehow in order to update. But the classifier is up to you, right? It could be horrible. And if it's horrible in the beginning, this will never improve it. It will only make it worse. So I think that is more of a, if it's good, it gets better. If it's bad, it gets worse. I mean, under these kind of assumptions, we might be able to show something. So, okay, one, um, do you mean one, any specific method or? Any, do you mean a specific method or just Markov chain based in general? So we didn't compare to uh, Markov chains. There is two things. One thing is um, you can come up with like Markov models. Um, for example, if you don't do this iterative sequential thing, but you just given a whole number of test images to classify, then you can like do some Markov random field and th similar images should have similar labels. That's a little bit like transductive or semi-supervised learning where you make joint decision about a large number of images at the same time. We did something like that. This doesn't really apply here because we, I mean, we want to do the sequential thing. I want my, um, I don't know, cash register to give an answer immediately and not wait for 100 items to come in. Um, the other thing we could have done is we could have done a Markov chain of which, of like modeling the dependence between classes by uh, not a zeroth order, but like a first order Markov chain. What's the next label given the previous? We didn't do that either because for our data it would overfit because it is a Markov chain. And the real world is not a Markov chain. So we would just recover our data generation process, and that's not what we are after. Um, for the text example, it might be possible. But we, we looked a little bit into it after that paper, and I'm not sure it's going to work very well, because um, already a first order Markov chain would be quadratic in the number of classes. So given this class, how likely is the next class? And with 1,000 classes, that's the 1,000 by 1,000 matrix. You need a lot of images to fill even, I mean, to get a reliable estimate of the transition probabilities. Um, with a window of 100, you will not, I mean, the matrix will just stay empty. Um, so you will have to fall back to some kind of zeroth order just for safety often. Yes, so um, yeah, that's essentially the, the first thing I meant. If you want to classify multiple images at the same time, then you can reuse similarity between them and come up with some Markov model or something like that. And it doesn't have to be image similarity. It could also be um, additional modalities, like has been taken at the same geolocation. That's, of course, a good indication. If something is at the same location, there's a good chance you see similar things. Um, we did something related uh, at, at BMVC the year before last. Um, it's called coconut co-classification. Um, so you classify many things at the same time, and that allows you to fix some mistakes of the original base classifier. Um, we didn't do it here because the sequential thing, I think, is, is important in practice. But yes, they are very related problems. Short to 
I, yes, so this, this would go to like more fine-grained, right? You have just one, one apple class at training time, but you have 50 apples in the shop. Um, we thought about it, we didn't see a good way how to do that without training something new, because if you're only able to tell apple, and now you want to go deeper in, somehow you need to inject the knowledge that there is even multiple apple types. Um, if they are not in the base class, that means you have to really change your classifier somehow. Um, you, you can think of some unsupervised approaches where if you have enough data from the shop, you cluster all, everything that is classified as Apple into subgroups, and then you will be able to train this subgroup of that subgroup. That is possible. Um, I mean, it's not perfect, but it's going to be better than nothing. Um, but you will not know which Apple class is which Apple class, so you still don't know what the price is. Right? So still somebody would have to go and say, this apple is, I don't know, delicious, and this is something else. And, I mean, it would kind of contradict the problem that you don't want to train new classifiers yourself, because then you would have to, I mean, buy yourself a new GPU cluster in the store. Or I mean, maybe you get classifiers as a service. That is possible. Isn't that somewhere equivalent between? Maybe it is more convenient because you can choose intensity to set approximate um, time of being in the same context. If you yes. Think it is I, it's not that we. What using. Yes. I mean, I think this is the incremental version of every time you check, and that gives you the, the new start probability. In the end, you get Poisson distributed length of subsequences. Um, we didn't look into these parts too much because this is the part how we generate test data. And it's clear that the true data in the world will not have these characteristics. Um, this is just a proxy because there's nothing better to use. Um, we would be happy to use, for example, videos, which are real sequences. But somebody would have to go and annotate each frame of the video, which objects are there. And we didn't have the time for that. Um, so it's. It's clearly not the right thing to do for evaluation. It's just the best we could come up with. Um, but yeah, well, maybe it's even equivalent to what you suggest. That's a good question. Um, I think it will be the same thing. You will be able to take your, if, OK, if your translation engine outputs sentences, which most, I guess, would do, I'm not sure you can do much. If it outputs many possible sentences, or if it actually outputs the probabilities, like in form of a conditional random field or so, then you might be in business, and you can learn certain properties. You would not learn counting priors, which classes are more likely. But I guess you could learn, again, some kind of conditional random field or some other representation, which is which words the client prefers. And then multiplying together would still give you the ground truth, I mean, the base optimal classifier for the new situation. Yes, you could not do counting. But ultimately, the counting is just one way of estimating probabilities. Yes, I mean, you would be 
Yes, th there's many directions how you would get rid of this L equals 100 or whatever fixed you say. So like estimating it on the fly would be a good thing. One option is just to try different ones and then concentrate on the one. So if you do get banded feedback or real feedback, you know if you made mistakes or not. So you might be able to choose the window that works best so far. And then um, that actually is some kind of online learning setting. Which out of these lengths should I trust? There's multiplicative weights, updates, and so on that will converge to the correct length if there is a correct length. That, I think, would be doable. We didn't look into that at all. Um, yes, if you will, I mean, if this, we didn't observe it to make that big a difference. We just tried, it worked. We tried a different one, no difference. So we didn't really care about model selection tuning so much. But um, if, it if you're in a situation where it does make a big difference, yes, there is, I'm sure there is better techniques than ours. Well, ours is none, so better than none. Thank you very much.